So, stories. I tell stories. I tell stories because I think they're how we remember things. But I heard a wonderful story at a company where I worked about three weeks ago. Big, global, multinational company in Switzerland, huge leadership conference. And the chief executive stood up and told a story. And when I was thinking about today, I thought, that's a great place to start. He told a story about a very, very successful executive in his company who was based in Hong Kong. He was, everybody loved him, he was very productive, he was a great leader, he made a lot of money, he was incredibly efficient, his team was very happy. And he was such a superstar that the chief executive and people at corporate headquarters said, we have to bring him over here. Let's bring him here, because this is a high potential candidate. We need him to understand how the whole company works. So they brought him over, and they got him settled, and they gave him some challenging assignments, and he failed. He looked around, he worked hard, he didn't seem to kind of get any results. And after about a year, they said, well, you know, maybe we've given him the wrong projects. Maybe we need to give him something easier or harder or more local or more global. Anyway, they gave him another year, and he still didn't succeed. And so they had one of those really difficult conversations, which was, what are we going to do? Should we let him go? And they were thinking, well, you know, he's been a good soldier. We'll give him a good package, but really, he can't stay. And at the last minute, the CEO said, you know, why don't we just send him back to Hong Kong? So they sent him back to Hong Kong, and once again, he was a superstar. What had happened? Well, the chief executive, I think, said something really brave. He said, it wasn't him. It was us. We didn't create the conditions in which he could be successful. In some ways, you could say that what he was arguing was, it's not nature, it's nurture. It's not the individual. It's the environment in which he or she works. I thought that was a really brave thing for the chief executive to say. And I thought it was especially brave because most people don't come to that conclusion. Most people say, the guy's no good, get rid of him. Right? It's his fault, it has to be his fault. He can't cut it, not tough enough, not smart enough, not something enough, not talented enough, not working hard enough. There's always something. But maybe it's not him. Maybe it's us. So, because of the World Cup, you know, I feel I have absolutely obliged to put in a football reference. And I'm really struck that when um, teams don't do very well, and you know, I come from Britain, so mostly teams in Britain don't do very well, it really strikes me that we never think the players are rubbish. We think the coach must be not very good. Instantly, this week, after England you know, failed to achieve its potential, um, <laughs> People said, well, should we get rid of the coach? They didn't say, should we get rid of the players? But in business, we always say, get rid of the players. But there was always more of them where they come from. Let's get rid of them. So I want to spend some time thinking about, instead, how do we create the conditions in which everyone that we employ, under whatever conditions, whether they're project workers, full-time employees, casual employees, freelancers, contractors, whoever they are, how do we create the conditions in which they are all going to succeed? And I want to start an exploration of that by telling you another story um, about 
a situation in which many people, including contractors, did not succeed. And this is a story set in the place where I come from, which is Texas. And in this case, it's a small town that nobody ever goes to unless they have to, called Texas City. Texans aren't very imaginative when it comes to naming their towns. <laughs> and Texas City has a very, very big oil refinery. It's the only reason you would ever go there. It's near Galveston, which is on the Gulf of Mexico. It has a huge oil refinery that is operated by many oil companies. And in 2005, an individual named Warren Briggs drove in to work one morning, and it was his 30th day of work in a row. He was doing 12-hour shifts, and it's fair to say he was pretty, feeling pretty tired. He went into the control room where he overlooked a very small part of the refinery, and he sat down to do his work, which was a job that had typically been done by three people, but now, because of cost-cutting and new technology, it was done just by one person, who was Warren Briggs. And as he sat there and as he had lunch in front of the 24 screens that he had to monitor to check that the refinery was working correctly, he noticed that an alarm started to go off. And he thought, he noticed it, and he thought, I need to just make it stop. So he scrambled around, his supervisor was somewhere else. He scrambled around trying to get it to stop. But before he could do that outside, which he couldn't see, but in the blazing hot Texas sunshine, essentially a tanker's worth of gasoline ran up a huge chimney and, it, and poured out all over the site, creating a vast vapor cloud. And when a nearby car backfired, the whole place blew up. The Texas City refinery disaster was one of the worst industrial accidents in American history. 15 people died, over 100 people were injured. It was a site run by BP, and it was caused by pretty much exactly the same conditions that subsequently, five years later, led to Deepwater Horizon. Now, why do I tell that story? Because I think it's a really good illustration of conditions in which people are not going to be able to succeed. Let's look at the way that Warren's working. First of all, Warren's sitting in front of 24 screens, 24 monitors. And if you learn nothing else today, I want it to be this. The human brain will not, cannot multitask. Not even women, though we have been told we can, which is just a way to get us to do more work for less money. <laughs> so your brain can't do it. It isn't built like a computer. It doesn't have parallel processing capabilities. In fact, your brain is quite small. It's quite lazy. It has a huge amount of work to do. And it can only do one thing at a time. Now, we may feel sometimes that we're multitasking because we switch very quickly from one thing to another, but actually what's happening when you do that is your brain is switching from one task to another task, however quickly, and there's always a point in the middle when it's actually not doing anything. So this is very exhausting, and it also creates what we come to think of as blind spots, so moments when something is happening but which we simply can't catch. Now, it's interesting to think how this plays out in all of our lives, because we mostly don't run refineries. But um, if you think, for example, as you're driving down the motorway, or as you're on a conference call, and you're also on your phone texting or checking email, there's something you're not paying attention to. You're either on the conference call or you're on the email, but I can guarantee you you're not on both. And you can see this in a very beautiful experiment, which is you can put people on driving simulators, and some of them you put on texting or listening on cell phones, just listening and talking. And then you can take another bunch of people and put them on the dri same driving simulator and give them enough vodka to go over the alcohol limit. 
And if you ever have this choice in real life between driving with someone who's on the phone or driving with someone who's drunk, go with the drunks. <laughs> because they're safer. They may not recover as fast, right? But they're safer. That's how much of your brain's capacity just being on the phone takes. And if you say to me, as people regularly do, well, I drove down the highway on my phone doing a conference call and I'm still here, I will have to explain that that's because the other drivers didn't do anything stupid. It's not because you were smart. So it's a beautiful illustration of actually just how limited our brain's capacity is. That there is a big difference between sitting in a car with someone whom you don't have to imagine and driving with them, and sitting on the phone, talking to them, imagining them, and driving the car. And that difference can be critical. So Warren Briggs, in front of 24 screens, cannot possibly do his job. Now, I teach at some business schools around the world, and I often do an experiment with my students, which is I'll show them a clip of business news. And usually there are two or three tickers underneath, which are typically stock prices. Sometimes if it's a Friday, there's weather forecasts or football scores down the right-hand side. And then there's a little box with a CEO or a senior executive trying to explain his corporate strategy. And I'll play them a clip of two or three minutes. And then I'll say, so what did you remember? And a couple will say they noticed a stock price or they noticed the weather in Barcelona or something like that. And then I'll say, okay, can you explain to me what's wrong with the chief executive's strategy. No one has a clue. Because, first of all, your brain can't keep up with all this visual noise. But what it specifically cannot do is listen to the chief executive and think about what he or she is saying at the same time. Now, I used to work in television, and I sometimes think that's what that format is for so that you won't think about what you're watching. <laughs> but whether it's intention or accident, I can tell you that you can't do serious critical thinking when you're trying to keep up with all of that information. So Warren Briggs can see that the alarm has gone off. But what he can't do is think about what might be causing it. Now, in addition to multitasking, of course, Warren has another profound handicap, which is he's very, very tired. 12 day sh 12 hour shifts, 30 days in a row, has left him with an accumulated sleep debt of a month and a half. That's how much sleep he would need to do solidly to feel that he had the cognitive capacity of a normal, alert, rested human being. Now, many of us, and I used to include myself in this, feel quite heroic when we work through the night. We feel quite heroic when we jump on a plane and fly to California or to Kiev or to Beijing, and we get off the plane and we slam into meetings and we cut deals and we feel really fantastically powerful. But the truth of the matter is that losing just one night's sleep reduces your brain's ability to the same degree as being over the alcohol limit. And you can do exactly the same experiment, driving simulators, lucky kids with vodka on one hand, unlucky kids having missed a night's sleep on the other. And once again, you're going to be better off with the drunks. Sleep has a profound effect on our ability to think. And Warren Briggs, who's a good kid and he's a dedicated employee, is sitting in front of 24 monitors, so tired that he cannot possibly think about what's happening, what's about to happen, or how to stop it. 
Now, I think what's really important about this research is it reminds us of something we're often in danger of forgetting, which is thinking is a physical activity. We may think it's virtual because we work on computers and because we aren't operating visible machinery anymore, but there is visible machinery operating, and it has certain working conditions that no contract can ever overwrite. Your brain isn't negotiable. You can't tell it you're going to get some sleep tomorrow. Could it please do some extra work tonight? And one of, the re one of the ways in which this happens is that as you get tired, the part of your brain that is responsible for keeping you awake takes over and takes all of your mental energy in the form of glucose away from other parts of your brain which are responsible for critical thinking. Now, from an evolutionary perspective, this makes perfect sense. If you're walking through the jungle and a lion jumps on you, you really don't need to think about what kind of lion is it. You just need to be awake enough to run like crazy, right? But we mostly, you know, we're mostly not walking through jungles anymore. We're mostly doing work that requires high-level cognitive capacity. But we aren't very good at looking after the machinery that does it. So I think if we want to figure out what are the conditions in which the excellent people that work for us can do their best work, the first thing we have to consider is that these people and their brains are assets that it need looking after. Engineers talk about asset integrity, by which they mean you repair and service critical machinery before it breaks. But in the kinds of businesses that we all run, the machinery is the brains of the individuals who work with us. And we have to look after them. So what else? What else makes groups of people do outstanding work? Well, this is a question that was posed uh, by a bunch of researchers at MIT. Of course, MIT started with the supposition, which I think is very common, which is, well, if you want a great team, surely it must be the case, after you've made sure that they're not tired and they're not multitasking, surely it must be the case that what you want are the smartest guys in the room. That's what every company says they want. We want the smartest guys or women in the room. But the, guy, the people who did the research at MIT discovered some rather interesting things. They took a large cohort of people, and they measured their intelligence on solving problems. And then they put them into teams to see which teams would solve high-order problems best, which meant doing it fastest or surfacing the largest number of possible solutions. And what astonished them was that the best teams were not necessarily the teams with the most number of people with the highest level of intelligence. So the best teams were neither the teams that had one person with astoundingly high IQ, nor were they the teams with a very high aggregate IQ. Instead, it turned out that the highest achieving teams their ability did, bore no relationship to IQ at all. What, ha, what, it, what characterized the three most successful, the most successful teams were three things. First of all, what the research has called social sensitivity. This is measured by something called reading the mind in the eye test. It's sometimes described as a test for empathy. But what it meant was that the teams that did best were highly tuned in to one another. There was a great deal of eye contact, and there was just a great deal of awareness of kind of mood, articulation, high order listening. The second thing that characterized these outstanding teams was that almost everybody in the teams contributed equally. So there were no passengers, but equally, there was nobody who dominated. 
And although nobody was timing it, what they discovered was in these really outstanding teams, roughly everybody spoke and contributed about the same amount of time. And the third characteristic that they found, which is not what they were looking for, and I know these guys, so I know it's not what they were looking for, they found that the more successful teams had more women in them. <laughs> and they don't know why that made them so successful. They don't know whether it meant there was a sort of double quotient of empathy. Was it just because they're different? So is this the power of diversity? Whatever it was, that's what they found. So, so this is really interesting because the, the researchers concluded it may be much easier to raise the collective intelligence of a group than it is to increase the individual intelligence of a person. That's a management challenge if I ever heard one. Now, I was talking about this to a group of business leaders recently, and one of them said, well, Margaret, if empathy is so important, can you teach it? Which I thought was a really fantastic question. And it reminded me of one of the best chief executives I've ever seen in action, a woman named Carol Vallone. Carol started a venture-backed company called Universal Learning Technologies, and she then merged it with a nonprofit from Canada called WebCT. The company became known as WebCT. Now, if you try to build a company that's backed by venture capitalists in the United States and merge it with a nonprofit from Canada, you are asking for trouble. <laughs> right? And that's even before they start playing hockey. However, Carol did something really brilliant, which is every year when it came time, she did many things that were brilliant, but in this case, every year when it came time to discuss and negotiate the budget for the year and the business plan for the year, she had every department head argue the budget for a department that was not their own. Technology had to defend the marketing budget Marketing had to defend the sales budget. Sales had to defend the general administration budget. It was a brilliant technique because, in fact, what she was doing is she was teaching empathy. She was teaching people how to see the business through the eyes of disciplines and departments, not their own. And the consequence of that was that all of them paid a lot of attention, because they definitely wanted to see how their colleagues defended their budget. But it also, of course, gave them a profound sense of the dependencies within the business and of the company as a whole. It was one of the simplest, most beautiful ways of breaking down silos I've ever seen. So can you teach empathy? Yeah, I think you can. And I think you can teach empathy not as a kind of soft, squishy, nice thing to have, but fundamentally as a business discipline, which is whether it's on a project or whether it's company-wide. Do you understand what everyone here needs from each other and why we need all of it for the whole thing to work? Now, there's been a lot of real-life study, of course, of great teams and what makes them fantastic. And one of them was done by a very interesting physicist named Alex Pentland. And Alex was really interested in how far is the, are the connections between people in teams and in companies important drivers of productivity. And so what he did is he studied all kinds of different companies from manufacturing plants to software developers to hospitals to call centers. And he had all the employees wear badges, which meant that they tracked everywhere they went and everyone they talked to. So this is a big, big data collection project, fundamentally. And they then started crunching the data and mapping it to see of the really productive teams and the really productive individuals was there anything in their map of communications that distinguished them? And not surprisingly, they discovered that the teams that were most productive 
had the highest level and number of communication events. And that moreover, those communication events were both inside work and outside work. So it wasn't all transactional communication, which I think is really important, and I'll come back to that a little later. Another fantastic academic, Richard, the late Richard Hackman, studied um, intelligence groups. Lots of people going through encrypted data, big data, looking for information patterns and clues. And what he discovered there was that the most productive teams were characterized by the degree of their helpfulness to each other. Now, when you put these two pieces of information together, it's really interesting for several reasons. One is it suggests that, once again, IQ, being the smartest guy in the room, is not the salient factor here. It's clearly about what's happening between people. Or as I like to think of it, it's not the bricks alone that make the building stand up. It's the mortar. And helpfulness is a really critical component here, because what does it do? It means that people share knowledge. It means that when you get stuck with a problem, you don't stay stuck. You can reach out to help other people. And interestingly, Hackman found that it tended to mean that there was a much more standard level of production across the team, whether the m team members had been there a long time or were relative newcomers. In other words, it helped to assure quality if people were in a helpful team, because instead of making up their own standard, they reached out to other people and said, how do you do this? Is this good enough? If it isn't, can you help me? So this is really interesting because it suggests that how far people are willing to help each other at work will have a profound impact, not just on how work feels, but Hackman demonstrated it has an impact on sales, on profit, on productivity, and on the company's ability to make accurate forecasts. Because helpfulness, once it's established, is a very stable feature, even if people moving in and out are less fixed. Now, I spend a lot of my life going and visiting companies. Um, particularly, I prefer going and visiting great companies. I'm, my trips to Texas City weren't as much fun as some of my other trips. Um, one of the companies I've visited that is a perfect, beautiful example of this is the structural engineering firm Arup. Now, many of you will probably have seen Arup signs all over the world. They built the Bird's Nest Stadium in Beijing. Uh, they built most of the Olympics in London. They are famous for building the most technologically demanding, bleeding edge structures in the world. And when I went to talk to the people at Arab, I was interested in what it was that made them so fantastically successful. This firm has lasted longer than most structural engineering firms. It has never had a single year of losses. It's been fantastically stable. It has a stellar reputation for being uh, unsusceptible to bribery and corruption, despite working in some very difficult territories. And so when I talked to the people at Arab, I said, well, how do you guys do this? And there were a couple of things that were really characteristic. One is the company has a very flat hierarchy. People are very driven by their desire to improve their skills. So you may run a project one day and be the most junior member of a project tomorrow, depending on what skill you have that the project needs or what skill you're trying to develop that you need. So people float around a lot. And of course, as they float around a lot, they get to know each other a lot. So they know where to turn when they get stuck. But this has become so characteristic and profound a piece of Arab's culture that they now regard it as a fundamental competitive advantage. Why? Well, one of the stories they told me was that when they were building for the uh, Beijing Olympics, they were building the equestrian center. 
Now, think about this problem for a second. You have a huge stable with a very large number of extremely expensive, highly neurotic racehorses. And they've just got off planes and long-haul flights. So they're not happy horses, right? They're in a strange place. They're jet-lagged. We all know how we feel, and we're probably not as neurotic as they are. Well, I'm not as neurotic as they are anyway. <laughs> so the question the engineers had was, what quantity of waste do I need to cater for? This is not something they teach you at engineering school, but it's the kind of problem that if you get it wrong, is going to be pretty horrible. So you could sit there for weeks with your Excel spreadsheet making assumptions about how big the horse is, what his normal waste production is, how it much worse it gets under pressure. And then you're just going to have to pick a scenario. And if you get it wrong, it's not going to be nice. So the engineer in charge of this was struggling with it, and eventually just sends out a company-wide email. Bear in mind, this is a company with 11,000 people. He sends out a question saying, this is my problem. Does anybody have a clue? And within an hour, he gets an answer from New York. An engineer who built the jockey club knows exactly how to figure this out. That's what has made Arup so successful. High degrees of helpfulness. High degrees of what I call social capital. The bonds between people, the trust between people, the reciprocity between people that make companies functional and resilient. High degrees of trust. Now, this is really challenging when, as in you know, the companies that you're working with and the companies that certainly that I've spent a lot of my life in, where you think, well, if trust is a function of time, we have a lot of people who haven't been around for a long time. We have a lot of people who may never have worked together. And I first experienced this kind of problem when I was running my first software business in the United States. And I hired you know, lots of really smart people, and I gave them desks and computers and tasks and assignments and all those things you expect, and told them to get to work. And they did. God bless them, they did. They worked like crazy. So you think, well, that's, all, that's it, right? That's all you need to do. You've got a goal. You've got your resources. You've got your deadline. You've got your project. It's all scoped out. It's all clear as anything. Well, it wasn't very effective. Things got done, and they weren't especially brilliant. They were slow, they were buggy, there was a lot of sniping. The engineers complained that the marketing, marketing people made too much noise. The marketers thought the engineers were just rather nerdy and should get over it. The finance people thought the sales people cost too much for people that were never there. You know, there was a lot of the sniping that you get in companies all the time, especially when people don't know each other very well. So I did something that was so simple, it's kind of embarrassing to talk about, but um, I talk about it because it worked, which is I thought, actually, nobody here knows each other. They're so task-oriented, and I think Brian may back me up here, that Americans are very task-oriented, that you know, they came in, they sat down, they worked, they went home. They had no idea who they were working with. So I said, OK, 4.30. Friday, every week, stop work, have a glass of wine, have a glass of beer. Three people every week are going to stand up and tell us who they are. And they may do that with a PowerPoint. They may do it by singing a song. They may write a play about themselves. They may do an animation. I don't care what it is. But that's what we're going to do. And everybody has to do it. Nobody gets out. And of course, I had to start what you know because I had to prove that it really was incredibly awkward and embarrassing <laughs> in order that everybody else would feel good that they did much better than I did. And this is so simple, but the effect on the company was unbelievable because people discovered, actually, we had amazing people in this company. We had a guy who'd sent one of the first ever emails in the history of the internet. 
We had an engineer who'd built the first AOL browser. We had all sorts of extraordinary people. We had a guy whose advertising tagline had been on a, the space shuttle. I mean, just astonishing things. And of course, as people told these stories, in whatever means they chose, and they become, became sometimes rather elaborate production numbers, but you could just feel the level of trust and respect and enjoyment shoot up. Now, as I've gone around talking about this sort of thing to companies all over the world, what's been really fantastic is the number of companies who told me, oh yeah, we did something like that. They don't think of it in terms of social capital. But once you give it that name, they start taking it seriously and they start saying, oh yes, we've done some of that. So I was in Manchester a couple of weeks ago talking to about 20 CEOs and two of them came up and told me, we stopped people having lunch at their desk. We have a nice lunchroom and we said, this, nobody, nobody is allowed to have lunch at their desk. They can go out if they want to go out, but if they're going to have lunch here, they have to have it in the lunchroom. Because guess what? Then they had to talk to each other. They had to make conversation and discover who they were working with. Something that in the 15 years of this company's history, nobody would ever much done. Sainsbury's, which is a big supermarket chain in the UK, instituted Email Free Friday. Why? Because if you're not allowed to send an email, what do you have to do? You have to get up and walk to someone's cubicle and speak to them. Huge change. Huge change. Pixar started doing lunch lotteries, which meant people drew lots for, to have lunch with people they didn't know. It was a kind of blind date inside the organization. Because the organization had become so big, they didn't know who was there. And because they had a very mobile workforce, some people working at home, some freelancers coming in, and it meant that everybody got to know someone. They adopted a system where any time someone joined the business for more than a week, they got some kind of buddy who, not in their department, who would show them around and explain to them how things worked and keep an eye on them and make sure that they were flourishing. All of these were incredibly simple ways of building social capital in the business. And I think what's so interesting is that it doesn't feel like work, and it doesn't especially look like work, except that it has a gigantic impact on work. And it comes back to Pentland's observation of his high-achieving teams having far more communication inside work and outside work, because the communication outside work built levels of trust inside work. Google, a couple years ago, did a gigantic big data project trying to identify its best managers. And they, of course, expected that this would be about towering technical expertise. So they were very surprised to discover it had nothing to do with that. Who were the best managers? What were their characteristics? They cared about the people working for them. They cared about them as people, they cared about their lives, and they cared about their careers. And if these individuals had questions or problems where they got stuck, they didn't give them the answer. They helped them figure it out. They worked together to solve the problem. Now, I think this is really interesting because I think it flies in the face of almost everything we've ever done in human resource and talent management. Mostly, what do we do? We create competitive situations with rewards and bonuses and forced ranking and evaluation. There's a fabulous research paper looking at how to kill creativity. That will do it. All of those, everything we do, perfect recipe for killing creativity. Expected rewards, oversight, expected assessment, and a competitive environment. Creates a sense of threat, so people develop tunnel vision, 
their imagination shuts down, they do what they think is required, which means they've lost all their imaginative capacity, and all they're really trying to do is stay out of trouble. Kind of like Warren Briggs, just trying to stop the alarm going off. Much more inspiring, I think, was an experience in the Israeli army where they took three out of 20 platoon leaders and they told those platoon leaders that having evaluated everyone, those three platoon leaders were fantastically lucky in having the best soldiers in their platoons. They were exceptional. These were the smartest guys. And then they came back and evaluated everybody after a year. Now, there's a trick in this experiment, as there is in almost all psychology experiments. And the trick was the three platoons were chosen completely at random. But at the end of the year, they were head and shoulders above everybody else. What was the difference? Their platoon leaders believed in them. They cared about them. And they gave them huge cha challenges and targets because they were totally convinced that they were up to it. I'll finish with just one more real life story. One of the most amazing companies it's ever been my privilege to visit. It's a company in Cleveland, Ohio, called Thermagon. Thermagon was started by a woman who's a chemist who worked for BP when it had a chemi chemicals division. She had this great idea. This is the beginning of the PC revolution. She had this great idea that the thing that was going to get in the way of PCs really getting bigger, and, well, getting smaller and faster, the gating factor was going to be heat. That as processors get more and more powerful, they produce more heat. And that was going to be a problem. And as a chemist, she thought she had the solution. Now, nobody at BP wanted to know. They thought, we're not in the computer business. Go away. So she did. She took her idea. She quit. She left. She became an entrepreneur. She set up with virtually no money. And she made some materials that she thought probably, on the whole, she didn't, couldn't afford fancy equipment to measure it, on the whole were 10 times more effective at getting rid of heat. And then she had this experience with all, which all entrepreneurs dream of, which is one day she's sitting there. And the phone rings, and it's a guy from Intel who says, we understand you have created something really good at getting rid of heat. She says, yeah. So, well, we're launching this new chip, and it's really powerful, but it gets really hot. Do you think you could help us? Well, of course, she says yes, you know, and the rest is history. There's a little bit of Carol Latham's business in everybody's laptop these days. She completely changed the game for chip manufacturers and PC manufacturers. But suddenly, she's at this inflection point, which all entrepreneurs dream of. And what does she need? She needs a lot of people. And she needs them really fast. And she's not in Silicon Valley. She's in Cleveland, which at the time, I don't know what it's like now, but at the time, it was a dump. Okay. So what does she do? She opens the back door of her office, and she drags in just about anybody she can find, mostly Hispanics and Latinos, most of whom have never finished high school. And she says, here is the deal. If you work for me, I will get teachers in here from the school district, and you will have an hour's teaching every day, paid time, if you will come and work for me. Carol Latham built her business on those people, many of whom finished high school in her offices. She, couldn't, she had no choice. She couldn't have done it any other way. But she proved quite brilliantly that at the end, what makes people fantastically productive whether they're short-term, long-term, on-contract, freelances, whatever they are, regardless even in her case of their education, there's fantastic productivity inside every single human being if you're prepared to put in the social capital to develop it. 
Thank you all very much. <laughs>